You are watching Notepad. I'm your host, Ibrahim Sani. There are two big developments when it comes to the Prime Minister today. The first is the special address that was given around 3 o'clock or 3.30pm um, uh, earlier today. And of course, the fact that he will be leaving to Indonesia, he's currently in Indonesia actually, um, to meet uh, President Jokowi. Um, and this is of course the first uh, trip outside of Malaysia since taking office as Prime Minister last year. So, uh, a lot to unpack. Let's go with uh, the special address first. Uh, the special address was given at a short notice, around 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, and a lot of people were talking about what kind of announcement is going to make. Turns out that there wasn't any announcement. It was exactly that. It was just an address. And the address is to underline a few things, i.e. SOP, talking about the rationale of why a total lockdown is not feasible when it comes to propping up the economy, and of course, stern warnings uh, to employers who continue to ask their staff or their, empl their employees to turn up to work even when uh, they're not supposed to. Of course, those are the things that uh, were mentioned on the surface, but there was one line that was in particular that uh, attracted a lot of attention. That is, of course, point number 54 in his uh, speech, if you have the PDF, um, widely circulated by now, I'm sure. Uh, that uh, the announcement of or the possibility to call for an election uh, will be done um, if uh, the uh, announcement of or if the pandemic is well controlled uh, in the country. Um, and of course, uh, this is not the first time that he has alluded to the fact that we will have a general election um, soon, GE15 soon. Uh, but at the same time, we also note that there's a lot of situational um, parameters that are in place whether or not this election can be called in the first place. Number one, who decides uh, that uh, the pandemic is uh, resolved and therefore it is safe? I'm using his words here in the uh, PDF. It is safe to uh, call for an election. Um, that's the first. The second is, of course, there is no timeline given and considering that we are currently under emergency and the parliamentary rules are now suspended, that means this can go on indefinitely. Um, and of course, uh, we've discussed this bullet point earlier when we talk about there is no recourse for the people to bring about, i.e. that the people cannot uh, go to court to sue against the government under emergency ordinance. So there's a lot of issues when it comes to what we can and cannot do as a people versus what the Prime Minister can or can do as the power of uh, the executive. Um, and because of that, there's a lot of issues into whether or not we should be excited or not excited about having an election in the near term. Remember, this election uh, notion is still split and divided across the people, uh, across the country. Uh, not many people want a GE anytime soon. Uh, some have argued that we should let the parliamentary term run its course and have an election at 2023 or at least near 2023 and then there's also the other half that says uh, enough with this politicking uh, and let's have an election and vote those that we don't want out and get the people that we do want in and perhaps a functioning coalition or a stronger coalition can be built post GE15. So because of the divided ideas that the people have when it comes to whether or not we want an election you mirror this with the fact that there is no possibility of us demanding an election because of current situation, i.e. the emergency and the power being rested, vested actually, uh, solely um, within the powers of the king on the advice of the Prime Minister. Uh, the reality is as such where we might not be able to gauge for certain whether or not we will uh, have a GE15. Observers argue uh, that uh, the election will still be done this year but these kind of observers would probably also argue that there's a lot of disclaimers in place. So, you know, you can't take their word for it. They won't stand behind their word, largely because they too don't know what's the situation on the ground and what is going on in the inner circle of the Prime Minister right now. So for now, what we need to do as, you know, the regular folk here is, number one, deal with our own issues, i.e. managing our own um, uh, pandemic-associated uh, uh, ailments, all right. Uh, stay at home if we can. If we can't, try to resolve our businesses demands and our uh, entrepreneurial demands uh, accordingly without trying to tie up with how the election will shape up. Because if you build your uh, ideas 
or build your plans based on what the Prime Minister can or cannot do or will or will not do, uh, it's a very tough situation to be in to plan properly if that is the case. So try to plan and do uh, the things that you have to do without uh, trying to think too much about what the government can or cannot do. There's a lot of uncertainties there. You can do whatever that is within your means, continue to do so. At least that's what I uh, want to share with you this um, evening. We'll go for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk more about the President's visit uh, to Indonesia and what could possibly be discussed uh, during his visit in Jakarta. That's coming up next after these messages. Welcome back. This is Notepad. I'm your host, Ibrahim Sani. We continue our conversation on the Prime Minister uh, going to Indonesia for a work meeting. And of course, uh, this is his first time uh, leaving the country for a state visit since taking over the Prime Minister office uh, early last year. And... Um, yeah, once we get over that whole concept of whether or not uh, leaders of a country should travel overseas to meet other leaders of a country while at the same time trying to tackle the pandemic both at home and abroad, uh, once we get over that hill, let's talk about the possibility of what the conversation will be between the Prime Minister of Malaysia with the President of Indonesia. Uh, a research uh, report that was shared uh, via ISIS today um, was talking about three possibilities. Um, and this, uh, the three possibilities of the talking points uh, between the Prime Minister and the President of Indonesia uh, may revolve around first uh, is on the COVID situation itself, i.e. how is the vaccine going to be uh, obtained, how is it going to be delivered across people, and more importantly, how uh, it's going to be received uh, by the frontliners versus the general population. That's the first idea that they could possibly talk about. Second, of course, uh, is on the issue of palm oil. Uh, both countries, uh, the uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, constitute to about 85% of the global total output or producer of palm oil. And because of the negative uh, press that has been received, uh, in the EU, they are quite adamant on trying to reduce imports of palm oil from both Malaysia and Indonesia into the economic region, uh, the European economic region, um, for 2020 and 2021. In fact, they just want to remove it altogether by 2030. This will impact both Malaysia and Indonesia, and that could be the possibility of a discussion uh, in their talking points between Prime Minister Mohidin as well as President Jokowi. The third idea uh, is, of course, the general improved bilateral ties between the two countries. One has to argue that Malaysia and Indonesia are frenemies at best and uh, suspicious friends uh, at the worst because the situation right now is that we both have a long history uh, when it comes to cultural ties uh, and we are intertwined in our economies um, but at the same time, we have to remain competitive uh, moving forward. Uh, and we are both starting from different positions in terms of the economic uh, livelihood of the nations, the two nations. And while Malaysia is still struggling to break through that high-income nation status that we have been desiring since, um, I don't know, 1990s, uh, Indonesia is fast becoming that. Uh, and Indonesia has a lot of problems, but the one thing that has kept them going is, of course, economic growth. All the economic markers from economic livelihood, poverty, urban poverty, all these kind of uh, economic markers have shown tremendous increase uh, over the past few decades. And in the past few years, since President Jokowi has taken over, uh, the growth of uh, Indonesia has become quite significant for us to be talked about when it comes to the countries in ASEAN. And um, another country that needs to be talked about is, of course, Vietnam. But Vietnam, unlike Indonesia, does not have cultural ties with Malaysia. And because of that, 
the sensitivity that talk that revolves around how to remain competitive with a country like Vietnam is I guess straightforward. It's a cut and dry thing. We need to be competitive than Vietnam. Here are the ten things or five things that we need to do. But when it comes to Indonesia, there's a lot of uh, delicacy. There's a lot of delicate uh, issues that needs to be uh, negated. And because of this, uh, there has to be high-level talks that needs to be ironed out between the two leaders of both countries. Um, ministerial conversations that needs to take place between the two countries. And of course, the most important, important element of all, the entrepreneurs of both countries need to come together and think about how best to move forward. Because in order for us to uh, move ahead as an independent country, as a country that is economically prosperous and an economy that can be very competitive against one another, we have to realize that it's, we are stronger together than we are apart. And you know, ASEAN is not EU. ASEAN is very strange when it comes to an economic um, coalition. Much is left to be desired uh, when it comes to economic prosperity uh, amongst the countries within ASEAN. Uh, and of course, the political dynamics of each and every single country in ASEAN is also, uh, you know, I guess, left to be desired uh, because of the non-intervention policy that ASEAN uh, practices. It's a lot more sensitive when one ASEAN country needs to comment on the other. The case in point, of course, is Myanmar. When a military coup d'etat has taken place, you know, the foreign ministries of all ASEAN countries were not strong in their words in condemning you know, what is happening in Myanmar. And that's not, I guess, new uh, to uh, countries in ASEAN. It may seem strange to other economic blocs, um, like the EU for instance, uh, but amongst us and countries, that's just how it is done in this part of the world. And when it comes to diplomacy, you know, things that are tried and tested are normally deployed first before uh, ingenuity and disruption is going to be implemented. Businesses need a lot of time uh, to think about uh, when it comes to uh, how to make it work cross boundaries within ASEAN and it has to tie in very closely with how the businesses are working together with their respective governments and it's not going to be easy for you know, startups and you know, high powered, high energy uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, when they want to roll out their solutions across the region, it's not going to be easy. Uh, because there's so many restrictions that are in place, you know, things like uh, mobility of uh, workers. I'm not talking about during the pandemic, I'm talking about even before pandemic. It's not that easy for one ASEAN member to work as an expat in another uh, country uh, because of the restrictions in place. And it's, you know, normally reciprocal, right? Uh, if it's hard for an Indonesian expat to work in Malaysia, it's also hard for a Malaysian expat to work in Indonesia en masse, right? Maybe it works for one or two cases, but when it w one economic prosperity across the region, we need mobility, we need the ability for countrymen of one another to move freely the way we see uh, it is being done in the EU. So those are the kind of things that needs to be negated and I don't know wh whether one meeting between Prime Minister Mohidin versus President Joko is enough, but it does signal the importance of how Malaysia is viewing Indonesia. Remember, Malaysia, by you know, diplomatic terms, we're closer to Singapore than we are to Indonesia, when you think about it. Being a Johorian and half of my family members are in Singapore, I kind of know the situation right now between what Malaysia and, and Singapore is. But the Prime Minister took uh, the economic, uh, sorry, took the political um, uh, move to meet President Jokowi ahead of Pres uh, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong because of the urgency and the importance of us building bilateral ties with Indonesia. That must supersede all the other things that he is thinking about when it comes to uh, multilateral ties across the region. Those are the kind of things that we can see and guess from the Prime Minister. And as we discussed prior to uh, 
doing the uh, prior to going for the break just now, the Prime Minister did hint in his special address uh, earlier today that um, there is a possibility of an election being called this year. Should the pandemic be controlled well, and the Prime Minister will advise uh, the King to, uh, to, to have an election uh, during that time. And of course, uh, you know, everything is hanging in the balance. The COVID issue is, of course, the primary uh, problem that needs to be contended first. And all that is in place. But it still begs the question of uh, what will happen from now until the election when it comes to bilateral ties and multilateral ties between Malaysia and our neighbours and between Malaysia versus the, the economic superpowers out there between China, the US and the EU. Um, and with uh, the Prime Minister visiting Indonesia, making it his first state visit, this underscores the importance of Indonesia uh, in Prime Minister Muhyiddin's play uh, when it comes to building his own economic prosperity here in the country and strengthening his own political base here in the country in the near term, i.e. within this year. So those are the kind of things that we can expect moving forward when it comes to the Prime Minister's office. So that's it from me uh, for this uh, episode. I hope you do appreciate some of my analysis on this matter. And I will provide a link to the uh, statement or the analysis that has been given by ISIS, um, a report uh, that was published uh, earlier uh, this week. And uh, with this in mind, uh, stay safe and stay at home. Tomorrow, we will have uh, the Google MD, or the Google Malaysia boss, on the show talking about their report, E-Economy, uh, Southeast Asia 2020. It's a long-standing report. Uh, it's been covered uh, by this show for a few years now. And um, what happened uh, yesterday was that uh, uh, was uh, the uh, breakfast series hosted by Google where they had the CEOs of Maxis and the CEO of um, Picha Eats, uh, CEO of MDAC and Grab together with the CEO of Google, talking about the possibilities that lie in store for the future of digital in Malaysia. So those are the kind of things that is happening right now. Uh, that will take place, that conversation will take place um, tomorrow on Friday. But until then, for this particular show, thanks very much for watching. Catch you next time.